Um, I guess just the first thing is I will be recording this session. We have a couple of volunteers who are not going to be able to make it today, so um, I'm just going to record it. Uh, please let me know if you can't hear me. Also, um, let me know if you can't understand me, because some people do struggle a little bit with my accent, as you'll probably pick up. I'm not from Eastern. <laughs> so, um, welcome to BB2. My name is Suzanne Turner. Um, I'm actually the clinic lead at Friends for Life, but previously I was part of the behaviour team and I'm still very active um, within the behaviour team. Um, I guess my credentials are I am a um, certified professional dog trainer. And I am also an accredited dog trainer with the um, International Association of Animal Behaviour Consultants. So I do have a couple of doggy um, um, accreditations behind me. Um, what else? So I have been at Friends for Life for about two years. Um, I started as a volunteer. I went into staff and then I moved into a staff position. Um, so first of all, I think what I would love to do is maybe just go round the room. We've got, I think the group's normally about eight, so I think we've got at least double that today. So I'd love to just meet everybody. Um, I guess if you tell me your name, um, a little bit maybe about yourself, and then also um, why you are volunteering at Friends for Life or what it is that you really would like to achieve. I'm just going to write down your names as well as you talk so that I know exactly who you have attending. So, yeah, I don't know if someone wants to start or if I can just call names. Anyone want to? I can start. Yeah. Um, okay. You can hear me, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, my name's Linda Perez, and uh, right now I'm fostering pirate. Um, I, I came to Friends for Life because I wanted to have something to do with with uh, animals because I lost my dog in the spring and I really missed him, but um, I don't know if I'm going to get another pet because hopefully we'll be doing some traveling someday when the pandemic is over. <laughs> Excellent, great, thank you. How's Pirate doing? Oh, he's doing well. He's, he is, uh, you know, he was not house trained and so he is getting better, you know, not as many yeah, accidents. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, yeah. All right. Someone else? I'll go next. I'm uh, Bob Burris, and um, I uh, currently am not a pet owner. Um, my uh, husband does not want pets, and just like the other uh, person, I am uh, recently retired and plan to do tons of travel. So. Having a having a dog is just kind of uh, too much uh, with the travel schedule. Eventually, mm -hmm. but I, I enjoy uh, you know dogs and cats and want to spend time with them. Awesome. Maybe I'll just start picking names. Um, what about Danny? Do you want to say? I got into Friends for Life because me and my friend Emma. She's on the Zoom too. She, we were looking for somewhere to volunteer, just like to volunteer. And we both really, really love animals. So Friends River Life was just like perfect. Awesome. Um, I see we have Alana online. Hey, um, I'm Alana. I've been volunteering at Friends for Life for three years now. Um, I'm BV3 with cats and I'm kind of like a crazy cat lady at this point because I now have four. Um, but I started volunteering with Friends for Life because I quit my job and I needed something to take up some time. And now I do contract work. So when I'm not on a contract, I volunteer at Friends for Life. And I thought since we need more dog volunteers right now, I might as well get trained. Yay. It's nice to see you. I haven't seen you in a while. <laughs> yeah, it's been a minute. <laughs> Hello. Cool. And uh, Mia? Hi, I'm Mia. Um, I just moved down here from New York like two months ago. Uh, so I just wanted to get involved in volunteering and helping animals. Awesome. Um, Emma, you wanna? Hi, um, I got into Friends for Life because I came here one time for Girl Scouts like a really long time ago. 
and I remember it was super cool. Um, and I'm going to college to be a vet, so I wanted to get a little bit of experience before all that. Awesome. Well, you know, we do our, um, just to plug our clinics, because I am the clinic lead, but we do have our um, drive-through uh, clinics and we're always looking for volunteers. So that might be a really um, excellent experience for you, Emma. I'll look into that because I didn't know about uh, that. Yeah, that's no, cool. Um, Yasmin? Hi, I'm Yasmin and I'm a junior in high school. I have a cat at home and I'm kind of like Danny and Emma where I love animals and I would love to do something with animals in the future, you know, as a career path. So maybe become a vet, but um, that's what I thought Friends for Life would be perfect for me. Awesome, sounds great. Um, Katerina? Um, so legally, my name is Maya, but I go by Katerina. Um, I am a certified professional dog trainer, actually. Um, so I want to help as many dogs as possible, as well as gain as much experience as possible in as many settings as I can. Awesome. Can I just ask what your um, surname is, your second name? Um, so my last name is... Uh, is sorry, what? Thompson. Thompson, perfect. Sorry, if I speak over you, then I lose the audio. I tend to do it all the time. <laughs> You're fine. Um, Revka? Hi, I'm Revka. Um, I'm here because I am absolutely probably the biggest dog lover. I love dogs. I don't have my own right now, but I do live with two roommates and we both have a dog. I love all pets. Um, I am very passionate about volunteering and I figured being that I love dogs and I'm passionate about volunteering, this is the perfect place. And so far what I've learned online and the first course, it's wonderful so I can't wait to volunteer. Excellent. Thanks for having me. We're excited to have you. Um, can I just ask Rivka what is your sir, uh, your last name? Sigler. Sigler. Excellent. Um, Lorena? Hi I'm Lorena. I'm a junior in high school. I'm part of the National Honor Society, so I need volunteer hours, but I'm also pursuing a career in veterinary medicine. Ooh, nice. Um, Mason. Is my audio working? Yeah. Okay, fantastic. So I'm Mason. Um, I'm new to the Houston area. I just kind of moved here a few months ago for work. And um, I really like dogs. I plan on getting my own in a few months. And um, I just wanted a place to kind of volunteer and also um, improve my ability to kind of work with dogs as well. So I think this is a great place to do that. Awesome. Perfect. Alisa. Hi, my name is Alyssa Marsh. Um, I'm a diver from NASA, so I work at the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory. I have two very spoiled Yorkshire Terriers of my own. And while I love what I do, my, my heart has always been with animals. So I found out about Friends for Life through Dr. Trevino. He used to be my animal's veterinarian. So like, or unfortunately, I've had to find a different vet since he's off in Washington now. But he, he made such a big impact, just his passion. So I can only imagine how the rest of you guys are. I love being part of something bigger than than myself. I'm very excited to be, be here. Awesome. Excellent. Yeah, we love Dr. T. We miss him. Oh, I can imagine. Yeah. He's an awesome, awesome guy. Yeah. Um, Emily? Hi, I'm Emily, or you guys can call me Emmy for short. I work in the nonprofit world and I am here. I actually, I got my BV1 training a while back, but because of the quarantine, I was a little afraid to hop back into the waters. 
but um, I love dogs and I, I loved training my sister's dogs how to do small tricks and if I can help with any kind of bigger things as far as behavioral issues go, that would be incredible. Awesome. Sound good. For some reason, my screen all jumped about there, so everybody's kind of <laughs> moved a little bit. Um, Angelina. Um, um, hi, I'm Angelina. I'm a junior in high school. I found out about Friends for Life from my friend who actually wants to become a veterinarian. So that's cool, in my opinion. Um, I own a puppy. Um, uh, <laughs> Sounds good to me. Can I ask um, Angelina, what is your last name? Caldera. Caldera? Okay, awesome. Um, what about Helen? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, okay. I can't turn my camera on for some reason. I don't know why. But um, Helen Cerrone, C-I-R-R-O-N-E. I joined Friends for Life in June 2018 to work with dogs. And, and, and I recently uh, did volunteer hours at the front desk training. I'm going to do it again, I think, next week, I believe, with Carrie. Carrie. Yeah. And I also did a clinic, which I liked. That was fun. Awesome. I just want to continue the work there. Nice. All right. I have S. McDonald. Hi, uh, sorry, I just um, walked in, in the door. Uh, hi, I'm Sanalka and I wanted to volunteer. I just recently moved to Houston and basically I wanted to learn more about dogs um, and I thought that this would be a good opportunity to be able to volunteer and also um, learn how to train my own dog in the future. Excellent, that sounds good. Can I just what, what was your first name again? First name Sanalka, S-E-N-A-L-K-A. -A. Excellent. I just want to make sure that you guys all get the credit for attending this morning or this, evening, or this afternoon. Um, Caroline. Oh, I think you're still muted. Let me unmute. Oh, there we go. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, I'm Carolyn. Uh, I've taken BB1 a while ago, and of course the COVID and everything and things happen. And so, um, so, uh, but I enroll in the foster program as well. So I would like to foster dogs. I have four of my own dogs that I train, and uh, I have a certification with Karen Pryor. Uh, nice. And also, um, I'm also a certified instructor with uh, Do More With Your Dogs and an AKC evaluator as well. So I am going into the dog career when I retire. I teach at the community college right now. So I would like to volunteer and work with dogs. Um, you know, Friends for Life has been highly recommended to me. So to work with, yeah. Excellent. Wow, we've got a great group today. I'm excited. Maybe some of you guys will be able to teach me the training today. <laughs> still learning. <laughs> <laughs> we're, all, we're all still learning. We never stop learning. That's the thing. No, every dog is different. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so, um, so I guess most of you have... So BB1, I know that's an online thing now. Is it Melissa who does that or is it Savannah? It's Savannah. I believe it's Savannah. Yeah. Give it Savannah. Yeah, it's Savannah. Okay, perfect. So normally for the BB2, it would be Melissa um, 
Taylor, who's actually our behavior and training manager. Um, she's unable to do it right now, so I'm just standing in for her. But I know that she will be super excited to meet you guys, and you will have a lot more to do with Melissa as you kind of progress through the program. Um, so one of the things that I was going to just start with is an overview of the BB program. Um, so you guys have all just done your BB1. Can anybody tell me what BB1 really covers? It's covering all the um, the things like the Kong and, and different enrichment activities for the dogs. Perfect, absolutely. And just to, um, just to add to that is, um, and the cats. So all the enrichment, or not all the enrich all the enrichment activities you can do in some diff slightly different form, but for the cats and for the dogs. So um, that's really important. Um, does anybody want to share a quick thought of what they thought of the BB1 stuff? Did anybody do it with their animals? Yeah, me and Emma got to go to the shelter yesterday since we don't have any animals at home and we like prepared the Kongs and we did like, um, we did, we met Nala and played with her outside and did like the tugging and stuff. So that was really fun. Excellent. Yeah, I think you guys did the flirt pool. Is that right? Cool. All right. Well, I guess you guys have touched on BB1. So I'll just run through, because this is really your first face-to-face -face, um, kind of discussion with um, a member of the behavior staff, I guess. Um, I'll just run through actually what the overall program looks like. Um, if you guys want to, you can just ask questions, either just raise your hand, or if you want to, just pop it in the chat, and I'll monitor the chat and just answer it as we go through. This is really meant to be an interactive um, kind of uh, session. It's not me just sitting lecturing you guys. I really want it to be more like a conversation. Um, yeah. So we have the BB1. Um, BB1 really focuses on enrichment. Enrichment is, um, covers so many different areas. Almost everything really that we do at the shelter with the dogs is some form of enrichment. So whether you're walking the dogs, um, you know, you're playing with the dogs in the yard, you're giving them um, foraging toys. Um, what else do we do? You know, we do scent enrichment, we do um, oral enrichment. So it covers a massive um, um, spread of activities. And it's really, really important because as you can imagine, shelter life can be very, very boring for both their cats and their dogs. They're stuck in a kennel for the majority of the day. So when they're out and, and even in their kennel, you want to try and keep them as kind of busy and using their brain um, as we possibly can. Uh, um, no. Okay. <laughs> um, you might, as we go through, if I feel like there's a little bit of noise or feedback coming through, I might put you on mute if you're not on mute. Um, okay, so BB1, yes, yeah, all about enrichment. It's about really making our life, our dog, our animals' lives at the shelter as um, positive and as rich as we possibly can. And it's also very important for our animals at home. And um, I really, really suggest that you try a lot of the enrichment activities with your own animals. Um, you know, it's, it's just exciting. If you think about our animals, if they were actually in the wild, what they would be doing all day, they wouldn't be sitting in a crate. They wouldn't be sitting, you know, at home. They would be out, they would be hunting, they would be playing, they would be, you know, socializing with the other, other members of their species. BB2, um, it really focuses on um, dog body language. Um, 
Yeah, so we focus on dog body language. The reason we focus on that is some of the um, goals and activities that you have to do in BB2 is we want to do dog to dog introductions. So it's really important we understand the dog's body language because that's their way of communicating with us how they are feeling about the other dog. Um, and we also do um, managing reactive dogs on walks. So that's really going to be the two key things that we do. Um, a lot of our dogs, if you have been to the shelter, you will see a lot of our dogs are actually reactive dogs. So that's why we have such a big focus on managing reactive dogs. Um, the dogs can be reactive to different things. It can be other dogs, it can be cats, it can be squirrels, it can be people, it can be garbage trucks, it can be a whole raft of things. Um, yeah, so that's really going to be the two key goals um, that we have from BB2. Um, BB3 is when you start to actually look at the science of learning. So you want to look at, you know, how do animals learn? Why do animals do the way, what they do? Um, how, and also how we can train our animals. So we will work with animals and teach them how to do novel things. So BB3 is much more... Um, looking at the more scientific side of it um, and how to actually train and teach our animals. And then our BB4 is like the final level and that's really looking at how we train others to train their animals. So, um, which is really important in the shelter environment as well, because um, obviously our main goal is really finding our animals, good adopt, adoptive parents. Um, so it's important that we're able to work with those adoptive parents to ensure the animals stay at home, um, you know, and stay in a good family. Any questions about that? That was all very quick. All good? Okay. I do have a question actually. Yeah. Um, I know there are um, specific hours that we're supposed to put in between each level. Could you remind me of what that would look like? So for BB2 or for um, BB? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So BB2 is not specifically um, hours, it's much more related to activities. So I will actually. Um, I'm going to go over to the Facebook page. I'm going to show you um, the list of goals for BB2, and then we can talk about exactly what the expectation is for you to do to then move on to BB3. And also, um, just remember, you know, some of our volunteers would love to work up through the BB levels. Other of our volunteers are like, you know, I've reached BB2, I can walk most of the dogs, I'm on the teams, I'm happy being where I am or they had BB3 or they had BB4. And actually most of our BB4 volunteers um, do go on to set their CPBT, which is the Certified Professional Dog Trainers um, Knowledge Assessed um, Accreditation. Um, you know, lots of our volunteers want to do that. Some volunteers don't want to do that. So it's really up to you guys. The program is tailored so that you can do up to whatever level you like. So. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Can you guys see, um, you should be looking at the Friends for Life Behaviour Volunteers page. You can see that? Yeah. Perfect. So if you have Facebook and you're able to do it right now, I would um, suggest that you try and find this page and then you ask to be a member. And what I can do is I can um, make you members while we're here. If not, just at the end of this session, if you, um, you find the Facebook page um, and Actually, I should be able to share it in the chat. Let's see if I can do that. Okay. That should be the link. 
So the this is the Friends for Life Behavior Volunteers page. It's a really nice page to be able to share um, different information. You know, I will, if I'm training with the dog at the shelter, I'll try and take video of my training session. I'll then share it up here so that other people can see exactly what I'm doing with the dog. And then when you come in, you can see if, you know, that's something you're able to do with the dog. I guess, um, you know, always just talking to our staff and ensuring that it's something that you are able to do. Um, also, as part of this page, what we'll see is if you look at the top, there's like a discussion, there's units, under the units, um, I think, okay, we haven't done that yet. We're looking to actually start to add some units in here. If you go all the way across and find files, if you look at the files, you will find under here, there is the behavior volunteer to log. So this log, um, that wasn't, oh yeah, here it is. So this log, we can open up So this log details exactly what the expectations are for each of you as a BB2, um, an adult BB2. So you will see, this is, um, right now we're not asking you to do the BB1 training. Um, previously, when the shelter was open to everybody, it wasn't in the middle of a crazy pandemic, and we weren't limiting access to the shelter then we would actually ask our BV2s to get involved with the BV1 training. So they would come in, they would work with Melissa or one of our other behaviour team members, um, and they would actually help train our BV1s. The, one of the things about being a behaviour volunteer is it's very much about teamwork. BV2 is very much about teamwork because a lot of the activities that you do, you can't do on your own. You need to do it with someone else. So we encourage our babies to kind of get to know each other. The Facebook page is another good way of doing that. Um, so the first thing that we really expect you guys to do is we want you to participate in five play dates. These play dates are, um, should be with dogs who have already met each other. They've already been introduced to each other. Oh no, yeah. Um, it should be dogs that we've already introduced or met with each other. So during, um, actually I haven't gone through the BB2 training um, format. So the first session today is, um, it's, we're going to go through the activities that we expect you to do. Um, and we'll also talk about um, actually dog body language. At the end, we'll just discuss a time that might suit everybody. We might have to find a couple of times and we'll do a second Zoom call. That Zoom call will actually talk through um, what managing a reactive dog looks like. So there's quite a little bit of sign sense there. So it's about an hour long. So that's another Zoom call. Session three is actually when we demonstrate how you do a dog play group play date, so how we do um, dog to dog introductions, and then also how we physically manage a reactive dog on a walk. So we do it now in three um, separate sessions. The third session is at the shelter, and it's um, it will be with one of our behaviour staff. Any questions about that? Can you go over the sessions again? The first one was a five play dates, and what was the second one? Okay, no, so the sessions are um, the, the training sessions that you have to do um, to become like qualified to be a v BV2. The first one is this Zoom call. The, okay. second, the second one is another Zoom call where we talk about the management of a reactive dog on a walk. Okay. And then the third session is actually a session when you come into the shelter and we will um, go over how to do dog-to-dog -dog introductions 
I mean, okay. we'll also physically walk a reactive dog and demonstrate how we do that. Okay. Yeah. I have a question. Yes. We also need the 30 enrichment sessions, right? So, um, yeah. So ideally to get to this point, you should have done 30 enrichment sessions. And I know that there has been, we're very keen to get more people into the BB2 program um, and into the shelter and working with their dogs. So I would ask if you haven't done your 30 enrichment sessions to just try and continue working on them as well. And actually, if you come into the shelter, once you've done your BB2, you can also log some of those activities as your enrichment. So it's kind of an overlap of BB1 and BB2. But for example, walking a dog, you know, if you give them a long sniff walk, that's enrichment for them. You know, if you play with the dog in the yard, that's enrichment. If you do some training, that's enrichment. And also it's not, if you come into the shelter and you do one, um, one shift that shift is not one enrichment session it's whatever you did within that shift so if you did like um a walk and you play with nala with the flirt pole and then you did some kongs and then you did some snuffle mats for the kit cats that would be four enrichment sessions so each individual session is is one enrichment session. So if if you get what i mean I also have a quick question about those enrichment sessions. Yeah. Um, we need 30 ones with dogs or do cats, will they count into our 30 sessions? Yeah, cats count too. So you can do it with dogs and cats. The BB1, it's all about just learning what enrichment is, the importance of enrichment. So if you can do it with dogs or cats, we are also counting if you have a dog at home, a cat at home, if you, do, you have a foster dog or foster cat, you know, if you do some training with your neighbor's dog, we're counting all of those as enrichment. Um, we realize right now it's a crazy world we're living in and it's just not practical for you, all of you guys to come in and actually do 30 enrichment session, uh, you know, 30 enrichment activities at the shelter. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions about BB1 or the enrichment? Okay, so once you've actually done your three BB2 training sessions, so um, once those are complete, you can actually start to log your BB activities. So yeah, we talked about the first of these are dog play dates. Um, and these can be a couple of things, I guess, if it's um, two behavior volunteers, if you talk to the staff and they say, yeah, those two dogs are friends, they can go out on a play date together. Um, BV2s can take them out. Um, also, if staff members are like, okay, we're going to do a play date, would you like to come along? You know, that's that counts as a play date too. I guess what we don't want to do is just introduce any random two dogs into a play date because that's not going to work. <laughs> I think the other challenge that we're finding with the play dates right now is um, most of our dogs are actually out in foster. Um, the dogs that we do have at the shelter are not easy dogs to do introductions with, so they don't have many playmates. So when you come to the shelter, it can be very difficult to actually participate in play dates. Um, a different way of doing it is um, instead of play dates is we actually do parallel walks. So we will talk about parallel walks a little bit more in that third session when we're talking about the play dates. But parallel walks are basically nice ways for dogs to kind of, and they're not interacting with each other. They can see each other. We can look at their body language. We want to monitor their body language and make sure their body language is nice and soft during the, the walk. Um, um, and yeah, and we can like kind of get them closer or further apart as required. So parallel walks is another good alternative to play dates. And here you would just mark your dogs, your date, and any notes that you have on the play date. So then, Suzanne, in order for us to come into the shelter, we have to arrange it with a trainer, correct? To, to, to do these enrichments? Um, yeah, so right now, I think once you're a BB2, um, uh -huh. you will be able to sign up for shifts. Okay, 
Okay. Yeah. So right now, because the level of the dogs that we have right here right now, um, most of our dogs are either reactive dogs or they have some kind of um, behavior challenge, let's say. So we, okay. just want, we want our volunteers to um, have a little bit more experience. Um, so yeah, once you've completed your BB2 training, um, you'll be able to actually sign up and be able to come into the show. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Okay. So then the next thing is actually reactive dog walks. So the, what, what this means is once you come into the shelter, once you're introduced to one of our reactive dogs, so one of the favorite ones that we have here is Julio. Now Julio can be very reactive. He um, can react to dogs, he can react to storm drains, to slow UPS vans. He's a bit of a special boy. But anyway, he can be quite reactive. But what we want is actually, when we walk our dogs, we don't want our dogs to react. So what we, what we expect from our BB2s are that they are able to log five well-managed reactive dog walks. So, you know, if you come in on Monday and you take out Julio, you take him around the block, he, react, he doesn't react to anything, you can log that as a well-managed reactive dog walk. If you come in on Tuesday and you take Julio and he barks at everything the whole way through the walk, which he should not be doing, then you cannot walk that because that is not a well-managed dog walk. We always want our dogs to be keeping under threshold. We don't want them barking and lunging at anything. Any questions about that? So when you're walking a reactive dog, um, if you know, they do react, but then you're able to redirect and all of that and keep them under threshold, that's still technically a well-mannered walk, correct? Yeah, yeah, I would say so. I mean, it's like this morning I walked, um, oh, am I still showing you? Are you seeing a, I don't think I'm sharing the right thing. Okay, here we go. Okay, can you guys see this? Yes. Okay, this, yeah, this is what you're meant to be seeing. Yeah, if I'm not showing the, um, the right thing, then please just call me, <laughs> tell me. <laughs> the one, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so like this morning I took out Julio and we walked around the block and generally it was a very, very good walk. And then at one point we were just, surrounded in people and every single person had a dog and he kind of did a whiff at two dogs and walked past. I said, yes, he refocused on me and he took the trait. So is that a perfectly well-managed walk? No, but it was still pretty well-managed in the fact that he did bark once, but then he was able to really um, focus on me. He wasn't barking and lunging and trying to get towards the dogs. What's your average uh, dog walk time? Um, it just depends. With a reactive dog. Yeah, it just depends. It depends what time of the day it is as well here. Okay. Like in the morning, we've kind of got to structure where in the morning um, everybody comes in and we get all the dogs out and it's quite kind of pee and poop break. You know, they've been in their kennels all night. So we just want to get them out, let them have a quick toilet break, then get them back in. We then do training with all our dogs. Um, so between about eight o'clock and 10 o'clock, we'll do training with every single one of the dogs. And then between 10 and I guess 12, one o'clock, we get all the dogs out for a slightly longer walk. Okay. I like to try and get them out for maybe 20 minutes, you know, try and get their heart raised a little bit. Um, and then we'll do the same again in the afternoon between about two and four. Um, sometimes um, you're allowed, to, well not sometimes, but you are allowed to take the dogs. Once you know a dog, if you're on a dog team, you can take the dogs out for field trips, you can take them out to, you know, parks, you can take them, I don't know, some of our dogs like to go to the drive through <laughs> they like to go to the <laughs> you laugh, but some of them really do. Um, yeah. I remember Reggie likes french fries. That's right. Reggie loves to go to the drive through and he gets French fries. So, I mean, he does it now because he's been adopted, but yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so it just depends. Um, also depends on the weather. If it's really hot and humid, nobody wants to be out for too long. Right. And the dogs. If it's a nice cooler day, we might try and spend a little bit more time outside with them. And, you know, we, we've also got the yard. So some dogs can go out for a walk anywhere. Some dogs we try and we ask the volunteers just to work with them in the, in the yard because they might be more reactive. There's a whole heap of different things. Okay, so video ethograms posted. So we ask for you to do three video ethograms. Now, an ethogram is basically you watch what the dog's doing and you talk through like second by second what you observe about the dog's body language. Um, I tend to recommend a video of 20 to 30 seconds because there is so much that happens in a video of 20 to 30 seconds. Um, it's kind of crazy. Like we think, oh, the dog's just sniffing. But once you start really watching the body language, you'll see the dog sniffs and his ears might flip back, it flips forward, the mouth might close, it might open up, the tongue might hang out, it might pull back in. You know, the dog's body might stiffen, the tail might go up, it goes down, it's between the legs. There's a lot that the dog does um, and that really communicates to us, you know, how that dog feels in this specific situation. So we ask that you do three video ethograms and um, ideally you post them to the volunteer page. So if you go to the volunteer page, um, you can search for ethograms or, um, and there's a couple there. I will try and post some or repost them so that they're at the top and you'll be able to find them. Um, but yeah, we ask that you do three video ethograms. And it can be, you know, ideally we like, you know, two dogs playing together so you can and maybe just focus on one dog if it's easier but you know talk through exactly what you see and these are really just to hone your skills like it's easy to kind of go oh yeah I see that dog I know what it feel like it's feeling but actually what we're looking for is can you see those little changes in the body language because as you become a more and more experienced um, behavior volunteer understanding and being aware of those little changes is really important. Any questions about that? Okay. If you have any questions as we go through, just either pop it in the chat or, oh, I said raise your hand, but actually I forgot now that I'm, I've got my screen sharing, I can't see if you raise your hand because I can't see everybody. So yeah, pop it in the chat or just kind of call out. Okay, and then the last thing that we ask for BB2 is there are a couple of reading requirements. We have on talking terms with the dogs, um, calming signals by Tura Regas. Um, this is a really great book. It's really easy to read. It's um, lots of pictures and it talks a lot about calming signals. Um, and then the other one is The Culture Clash by Jean Donaldson. So we recommend that you get both those books and, and have a read of them. Okay, any questions about any of these? So I guess I do have a question. You said that was through the Facebook page. I, I'm one of the weird ones that don't have Facebook. So is that accessible through the volunteer portal? Well? Uh, we can't really do it through the volunteer portal, but what you can do is um, you can email things directly to Melissa. Okay. Yeah, so I will share. Um, so in the chat, I will share Melissa's address. So that's Melissa's address. And I guess I will give you my address too. Um, and then you have both of them. So Melissa is our behavior training manager, but she does, um, yeah. All right, thank you. No problem. And if you want, you can also email it to Melissa, but copy me on it. I'm happy for you to do that too. 
Okay. Mm. All right. So I, oh, okay. So one other thing I was going to show you is, so you do have your um, Better Impact page. So you have that paper log and you can just check things, you can write things down on there. But the best way to actually log your things is through your Better Impact. So um, I know that uh, you guys won't have really used Better Impact because you've not been here. So once you are a BB2, um, when you log on to the page, you'll be able to select opportunities and it will show you all, oh, okay. So I am actually, I, although I work for Friends for Life, I um, volunteer at Bark, so that's why Bark's on my page. <laughs> so I actually do all the play groups at Bark. I started play groups at Bark, so that's why Bark comes up on mine. But Friends for Life will come up like this. So when you um, actually do an, an activity, you will be able to, oh no, sorry, <laughs> I'm not showing you the page, jeez, oh, okay, I think if I scroll you my screen. There it is. There it is, jeez, okay, let's see. All right. Yeah. So the challenge is you're not going to see all the activities that you have available because you're going to see my activities. Um, okay, here we go. So if you come in, for example, and you do a shift. So when you sign up for a shift, you'll just go to opportunities and you sign up for a normal shift, whether it's a morning shift an afternoon shift, an evening shift. Then when you come in, you do your, um, your shift and then during the shift, you might do something like, you may do a play date and then you might do some training with a dog. So you can log those two things. So if you come in and you do three hours of a shift and then half an hour was a play date and then 20 minutes was training as a dog, you would, lo um, you would log your play date is 30 minutes of a play date. You will log training is 20 minutes training with the dog. And then you would log the remainder of the time, which is like two hours 10, as just your normal dog shift. Okay, so for example, here, you can see on this occasion in May, I was here and I was logging behavior, speciality training, behavior modification um, training. So for you guys, it would probably be, you know, like, um, let's have a look, like a behavior, enrichment, field trip, or animal behavior, play group. So you log one of those, you know, for 30 minutes. So if you do three play groups on one day, I really recommend that you log each of those play dates as a separate activity. The reason I say that is that when Melissa goes back and she's looking for through the activities, she can see it and she goes, okay, well, actually Danny on that day did three play dates. Instead of it just looking like one big play date, she can actually see you've done three play dates. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it does. Yes. Okay. So this is something that people do get a bit confused with because you know you sign up for a shift, but then within that shift, you can do different activities. And I think it's important for us to see where those different activities are, are being um, your time is spent. And it also helps when we're looking to progress to BB3, we can actually go back and track that. Okay, I think that's it. I think this is all the admin. I apologize, there's a lot because I am trying, we are trying to like fit in now the, um, we have to go over more things that we normally would do at BB1 training. But because we don't see you guys face to face, we have to kind of do it in um, here. All right, let's start with the canine body language.
Okay, so why is it important to be able to read dog body language? Um, first thing is it can prevent aggression towards people. You know, if we're approaching a dog and our dog is, and the dog is quite clearly giving us signals that they are not comfortable with you approaching and you understand those signals, then you can stop. The challenge is when people, dogs do give us the signals, they do communicate that they don't want us to continue approaching, but people either don't understand those signals or they don't listen to those signals. And that's when we have, um, you know, dog bites generally. The dog, you will hear so often, you know, the dog just bit him out of nowhere. That is generally not true. Generally, the dog will have shown some sort of signals to tell you that, you know, don't come any closer. I don't feel comfortable with you. It also prevents inter-dog aggression. So when we are working with our dogs, when we're introducing them to the other dogs, if we can clearly understand the body language going on between the two dogs, we can understand, okay, you know, these dogs are socially interested in each other. That's a really good sign. Or we can go, oh, actually, these two are definitely not socially interested in each other. It's probably not a good idea to introduce them. Let's try and do like a lower level activity with these two dogs. Um, it also reduces stress in shelter dogs. So if you know um, what a stressed dog looks like, and if you can recognize that the dog's stressed, then we can start to put in some management plans to reduce that stress. Um, maximizing training efficiency. I don't know if you guys have seen any of some of the training that we do, but one thing, um, one thing that we do is um, is cooperative care, for example. And the cooperative care is really all about working with our animals to do things that they don't normally like. So it could be something as simple as a nail trim or a vaccination. If we understand, again, what the dog's body language is um, telling us, we know when we can advance or when we need to stop or when we need to pull back. Same with training, you know, when we're walking reactive dogs, for example, we can tell by looking at the dog's body language, okay, yeah, you know, I'm not too close to that dog, my dog still looks relaxed, he's still looking wiggly, you know, his body's all loose, and then if you get too close, there's definitely signs that that dog is starting to tell you that he is no longer comfortable in that situation, and you're getting too close to the other dog. Um, and then just it generally minimizes human dog miscommunication. I mean, one of the biggest things that caregivers will say is, I just wish I could talk to my dog or, you know, I wish I understood what my dog was trying to tell me. Now, you know, obviously our dogs don't talk. They don't say, hey, I don't feel good about this situation, but they do tell us through their body language when they're not comfortable in certain situations. Any questions about any of that? No, ma'am. Good. Oh, now here we go. Like we can see in this, I mean, this is, you know, we see so many times, um, you know, dogs biting kids. And like, I think, what do people think that dog's trying to tell that child? Stop. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, you know. <laughs> His body's tense, his tail's down, he's leaning far away from that child, you know, and it's easy to predict that that could end in a not so positive situation. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, we like to, overall, we want to look at the dog's body as a whole. But one thing that we can do is actually break it down. And this is a nice little acronym that helps us remember. So it's T. So we're talking about tension, 
eyes, ears, tail and head. So these are the different parts of the body that we're going to be looking at. Our tension is not part of the body, it's just like the overall tension of the dog. Um, and Melissa emphasized to me that I wish to remember that there was another trainer who, this is actually attributed to another trainer and I can't remember the trainer's name, so apologies, but that's not ours, it is um, someone else's um, thoughts. Okay, so tension. So looking at this um, dog's kind of body, you know, his general demeanor, what do you think about the tension in this dog? There's no tension. No tension. Relaxed. 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 Yeah. So, and what tells us that? The body language, his calmness. Yeah. So you can see. He's, Ears are down. Yeah. Ears are down, tails down. Yeah. He's looking quite soft. He's got his eyes closed. But also, when we talk about the tension, for me, I think about tension as like tightness. And this is all very soft around the front of his head, around his mouth. This is all very soft. Okay, so looking at these two pictures, this is the same dog. Um, what do you see on the left hand side from a tension perspective? Is a little nervous. And what tells you he's a little bit nervous? Ears are back. The ears are down. Mouth is closed. Body mouth is, mouth is closed. Excellent. You guys are great. Yeah. He's, sta he's staring. Yep. The hard stare. Perfect. And then comparing that to the right, what, what do we see with this dog? What's the body language saying? Mouth is open. Tongue's out. Happy. Eyes are eyes are uh, are happy. Yeah, head needs to be lifted. Yeah, his ears. You can see here. Yeah. Like, there's a pull back a little. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's for me to think about tension. For me, it's like when the ears are pulled back and the mouth is pulled back, it creates these wrinkles and the tension in the face. You can see the face looks tight. Like here, this just looks soft. You know, the face looks soft. The eyes are like nice kind of almond shaped. The ears are kind of floppy. The body's soft. Yeah. You guys are great. I love it. <laughs> what about this guy? Give me my treat. <laughs> <laughs> He's waiting for a treat. <laughs> Roll the ball. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And what do you think about, I mean, we're talking about tension. What do you see in this picture that makes you think he's like, throw the ball, give me the train. He's atten his attention, he's focusing on, on something. His ears are up. His yeah, ears, yeah, are up. ears present alertness, but his mouth is open. So that's right. Aggressive. And his mouth's open. Yeah, perfect. And it's like, so I look at the, when their mouth is um, just right here, like around the corner of their mouths, like when they're kind of stressed, their mouths will close and this will become quite tight in tension. But yeah, like his eyes, like they're kind of soft almond, his ears are kind of pricked forward. You know, there's um, not a lot of tension in the tongue. The tongue is just kind of sitting there. You also see this part, like this part of the mouth is kind of quite loose. Um, if it was a stressed dog or that dog was particularly aroused, this area would start to tighten and you wouldn't see that as a nice open shape. Okay, so again, this is the same dog. Are we still in? Yeah. Okay, what do you, okay, what do we think about this picture on the left? Uneasy. Don't come any closer. No. He's afraid. A little uneasy, yeah. So what is telling us that? Why do we say those things? He's cowering down, kind of. Yeah. His mouth is closed. Uh, yeah. 
tension eyes. tension in the jaw yeah, yeah. eyes are very focused yeah ears forward yeah yeah, and the ears are an interesting one because I think this is one thing that I always try and um, um, emphasize that it's really good, especially have, if you have your own dog, but to understand what your dog's neutral stance looks like. Like, what does your dog look like when they're feeling, you know, relaxed? Like, where's the possession of their tail? Where's the possession of their ears? Because um, that can really, you know, because it's then those changes that we want to focus on. But yeah, this is definitely this dog. There is a lot of tension. And even his body, he's hunched over, is quite rigid. This looks quite stiff. Um, so yeah, what about the, the middle picture? He's content, he's relaxed. <clears throat> So what tells us that? He looks like he's smiling. The, ta the, the tongue is kind of out. The jowls are dropped. Yeah. Tongue's out. It's kind of got softish eyes. He's looking like, wow, this is fun. I'm ready to do <laughs> more. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, we always want to look, because that's the thing, like people will say to me, and I guess this is where um, the reason we focus on the body language is because people will say to me when I talk to them, oh, that dog's aggressive. Okay, why is that dog aggressive? He just looks aggressive. Okay, well, what is he doing that looks aggressive? Um, because my view of what an aggressive dog versus your view of an aggressive dog or my view of a happy dog versus your view of a happy dog can be very different and it's all led really up to misinterpretation. If I do a dog to dog and then I write up my notes and I said initially you know dog one approach dog two, dog one sniff dog two, his body was very stiff, his hair was high lower red, his eyes were quite hard and staring. That's a lot more information than just dog two, sniff, dog one, sniff dog two, he didn't like him. You know, so that's why it's really important that we're clear on exactly what we're seeing. What about this picture on the right? Could be hot and tired, but his eyes say something else. <laughs> What does his eyes say? It says he's worried about something. Or she. <laughs> yeah, I can't remember if it's a or she. I think he's... Um, I think he's focusing on his walk. That's what I see. <laughs> <laughs> he wants to go for his walk. So I guess, again, what do we see? What's telling us those things? I'd say between the ears and the tail standing up, seems like he's more alert, but not as timid as the first picture. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I would agree. I think there is definitely, um, you know, the, dog, the eyes are focused on something. You can see something. Um, Yeah, he look, you know, his tail is up and his eyes are focused on something. The mouth is still open, the tongue's kind of um, relaxed. But again, if you look at this relaxed tongue versus this tongue, you can see this tongue is a little bit tighter. Yeah. And again, you can see right here. Yeah. And you can see right here, like when I was saying, this bit's quite open here. You can see here it's just a slightly more, a little bit more tightened. So I wouldn't say like, oh, he's, you know, and, and a picture is very hard to judge because again, a picture is just one snapshot and it's like, um, you know, in time. But yeah, and there's a little bit of tension here as well. You can see, you know, the, the forehead's kind of wrinkling a little bit. It's not he, like here, but it's definitely not as relaxed as this one. Yeah. 
All right, I love it. Okay, well, my slide should look cool. Um, okay, <laughs> all right, this one. What, what about the tension in this photo? It looks a little worried. Yeah. What he almost looks like he could be shaking. Yeah. Shaking. So what tells us he's worried or he's shaking? His mouth looks closed and his ears are down. Yeah. Very focused on something. And, and just a hard stare. Yeah, whatever it is, he's staring. Seems nervous. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. Like, this is all quite tight. You know, his mouth looks as though it's clamped shut pretty tight. You can see, like, there's tension here. His ears are back, so the ears come back and it creates tension in the forehead. And also, you can even see, like, this little bit of wheel eye here. So, yeah, this this dog is, um, his, he looks pretty tense. What about this one? Don't bother me anymore. I'm going to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like it actually, David. Um, what and uh, why do you see that? What do you guys see? Very soft eyes. Ears are forward. Totally relaxed. Body. His body. His body looks really relaxed. Yeah, he doesn't seem stiff. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like it. Yeah, so I'll tell you what, you guys did better on this one than me, because Melissa showed me yesterday and I said, oh, his mouth looks tight. And she's like, what about the rest of his body? And I went, oh yeah, he's relaxed, his body's soft. Um, also, you can see both his legs are kind of lying out on this side. So he's not like in a state of getting ready to go, you know, he's super relaxed. So yeah. I like it. I like this group. You guys are doing great. Okay. So <laughs> the next thing, <laughs> the next thing are eyes. So we talk about attention. The next thing we look at are the eyes. So what do we think about these eyes? Couldn't be happier. <laughs> and why do mm -hmm. you say that? They're almond shaped. Yep. We don't see any skin furrowing around the eyes to to promote tension or to exude that. Yep. Perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Amazing. Looks like he's had a good run and he's ready. He's just really happy about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. His eyes are nice and soft. Um, they've got that nice almond shape. He's yes. It looks like he's inquisitive, like he's asking a question. <laughs> With his ears, maybe? <laughs> Is that... I guess it's his ears. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that's the hard thing, because like I look at a dog and it's like someone will be like, What do the eyes see? And I'm like, well, his face is quite tight, his mouth is closed, and it's like, no, but what do the eyes see? So um yeah, what about this one? So on the left, what do we see about these eyes? Stiff. Yeah. His head is like lower. You can see the white of his eyes, like he's yeah, just almost being at you with yeah. his eyes. Almost yeah. timid. Okay. Yeah, you can definitely see. I mean, this is a slightly harder stare. You can just you know, and again, it's the full picture, like, but even if you just look to those eyes, the eyes specifically show tension around it. You can see the white, they're a bit open. They're not that nice, soft almond shape. Compared to the one on the right, what do we see on the right? More open. More open, relaxed, kind of. Yeah. Oh. oh, it was me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, again, this is 
the same dog, so. Okay, so I think. Okay, this is a video. So again, you know, let's just call out what we see or put it in the chat. What do we see with this dog's eyes? Well, he's blinking. Seems relaxed and tired. <laughs> I think he looks nervous. Yeah. Yeah. He's unsure. Yeah, blinking. he's uncertain. He's maybe may yeah, uncertain. The multiple blanks. Yeah. And the yawn is kind of uh, like a submissive behavior. I hate this guy. And he's licking his, you know, he's putting out his tongue and licking, licking his lips <laughs> or lack of. <laughs> it almost looks like he did something hoping mama didn't find out about it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it almost looks like somebody's making him do something he doesn't want to do. Yeah. So what makes us, when it comes to his eyes, what makes us say that? Consistent blinking. He's not focused. Yeah, he's not focused on anything. Yeah. He's looking around like he's uncomfortable where he's at. Yeah. Yeah, so he's doing a lot of the squinting, the blinking, he's looking away. Um, you know, he's not giving that nice, soft, you know, eye contact. I mean, I, I don't know what, I don't know what the guys say to him in this video, but it makes me extremely uncomfortable. <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, so you guys were calling it, but you can definitely see through his eyes that this dog was feeling some stress in this situation. Uh, it looks like my dog used to look like when I used to point a camera at her. <laughs> he didn't like it. <laughs> he didn't like it. She would behave just like that. Yeah. I yeah. don't like you. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely, it can be like a stressful situation. She's like, oh. Okay, so now we're talking about whale eye. Can anybody tell me what is whale eye? You know? What is what? Oh, whale, whale eye. Whale, whale eye. eye, yeah. Wide open. What? It's a stare down, wide open. I'm going to come get you. <laughs> so the whale eye is when you can see with this wide open eye mm -hmm. and then when you can see this white. So that whale eye is when you can see that white showing in the side of the eye. So normally it's quite a hard eye and then, yeah, with the whale, the whale eye. Um, let's see this video. Oh, jeez, I keep pressing. And that's a wheel eye. So does that will, I mean, that he's afraid? Because he looks like he's afraid. Yeah, he's scared. Um, yeah. So he's, oh, oh geez. No, <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is why they don't let me near technology. Let's just have a look. Yeah, yeah so the whale eye is basically an indication of stress. It's, um, definitely an indicator that the dog is not comfortable about something. And when you see, I mean, 
when you see the eye like that, that is a very, um, to me, that's very obvious that that dog is not comfortable or he, and he's stressed. Um, and then there's other parts of him, you know, the other behaviors that he's showing, you know, like this lip licking, he's got the clamp jaw, but yeah, you can see definitely around those eyes, there's um, stress. Yeah, everybody yeah even even though even though he's moving his head his his eyes never go off what what he's worried about yeah, he's, yeah. so it doesn't necessarily mean that he's afraid he's you're just saying he's stressed well he's stressed it does it's normally um a sign of kind of fear. Yeah, you're right. It's like something, um, he's very uncomfortable about something. He's stressed about something and it's, it demonstrates a bit. You can see, I mean, this dog is really not comfortable with what's going on around it. Anybody got any questions or comments about the eyes? Uh, yeah, I do, Suzanne. Uh, sometimes my observation from dogs I've had is that you can see softness in the eyes, but yet there's tension in the body. Uh, so it's maybe it's a they're sure, but they're not sure. Yeah, so I guess and that's the difference. I mean, like you know when you did when you want like some um other kind of reactive dolls, like there's like a sequence of events that normally follows. So you know, there's parts of the body and different dolls can be different. So you know. You know, generally dogs will see something, they'll kind of focus into it, so their eyes can focus onto it, they get a little bit harder, then the body stiffens, the tail might lower or get really high and start flagging. So it just depends, like sometimes the dogs can be conflicted. It's like dogs who really, like they want to interact with people but they're also a bit fearful of people so they might have those soft eyes because they're kind of like oh I really want to interact with you but then they've got the stiffer body because it's kind of like but I'm a little bit unsure so it's that it's definitely conflict you know um, and it's important to just watch the, the body because hopefully you know over time if you start with the dog and they've got the soft eyes but their body's a little bit tense but then you know, you just spend time, you don't force them to do anything, then you'll start to see that body soften. However, maybe if their body was quite tight and then they had the soft eyes, but then you walked into the kennel with them, you might see those eyes start to harden, um, you know, and kind of start to stare because, you know, they're, they're moving into an area where, you know, they're not comfortable with you getting that close. So there's definitely those transition points um, and that's where you know looking at the whole body um, yeah because some dogs you know I'm trying to think of examples I mean my last foster like her tail was just clamped between her legs all the time um, but maybe it's just that the tail is going to be the last thing to really relax because at first when I got her, she would like slink around the floor with her tail tucked between her legs, her ears were back, she had the real eye. And then slowly, you know, she would stand up a bit taller, she wouldn't slink anymore. And then her ears would relax and then her eyes would relax and her mouth would relax, but her tail never came out, you know? But hopefully at some point that tail would come out. So it's just, those different transitions and the different parts of the body. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, sure. 
Okay, so let's talk about ears. I don't really know what to say about these ears. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody got any thoughts in these ears? <laughs> the ear, they look like puppy ears, they're happy puppy ears. <laughs> Still growing into them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it looks like yeah. curious. <clears throat> There was a dog that I almost adopted. Well, I think it was three years ago. Her, her name was Happy. I had her at the house for a week and then she got adopted by somebody else. Mm -hmm. That's what her ears look like. They were always happy. <laughs> looking, looking forward. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they're nice and kind of prepped up, facing forward. Again, there's not much tension in those ears. They're kind of crazy ears, but yeah, they look quite relaxed. Let's see what other ears we have. Okay, so we, we've seen this dog already, but I guess, um, what do we think about the left-hand picture? And the ears specifically. It looks um, pretty submissive. Yeah. It looks somewhat uncomfortable. I the eyes are kind of not right. Oh. Ears are bad. Oh, geez. What did I? <laughs> I did it. <laughs> forward. Jeez, I need to get We're getting a preview. <laughs> I know. Oh, I'm going the wrong way, that's why. <laughs> Jeez, we've got a lot to get through. I need to speed up a bit. Okay, this one. Yeah, so I think this one is kind of like on the left, the dog's quite a relative. Oh, for goodness. <laughs> why can I not do this? Um, yeah, like I would say the eyes are kind of quite soft in here, the mouth's open. Again, you can see like here, I mean, we're looking at the ear specifically, but the mouth around here is quite soft. These ears are just, yeah, it's important to know where the dog's, ah, dog's ears normally sit, because um, these ears are actually quite relaxed looking. Like here on the right hand side, um, what's the difference in the ears here? Well, they're up. They're upright. Yeah, they're upright. Yeah, so he's definitely, I mean, we've talked about this picture already, but there's definitely some kind of more focus, like he's, you know, He's focused on something, he's interested in something. So definitely a bit of a difference between the left versus the right. Okay. <laughs> okay, so for those of you who know Melissa, and everybody will meet Melissa at some point, this is Melissa's dog. She is called Mama Dog. And she's a bit crazy. <laughs> no, I shouldn't say that. But she uh, does not like strangers. Um, so what do we think on the left? What do we see about the ears? Ears are up. Yeah. Alert to something. Yeah. Okay, well, what about the right? What do we think about the right? The ears are low. Ears are up and looking back. They're, they're listening to something, whatever is going on behind them. Yeah, so I guess I know the story behind this, and it's quite a cute story. The picture on the left, the mama dog was a dog, I guess, came to the shelter and she had some puppies. Um, she's called Mama Dog because she's a great Mama Dog. Um, and then this was a year after her puppy girl born and they did a reunion. So the first photo on the left is where she first comes in and all her puppies were there. So her ears are kind of a little bit swiveled back. 
she's a little bit uncomfortable in this school's school. You can also see there is some like tension around her face. On the right is the end of the meeting. And um, what you can't see if you saw in the bigger picture is she actually is looking towards her, puppy, her puppies. So she's got her nice open mouth, her eyes are soft, and her ears are kind of flat, like behind, but they're not like flat back. They're just kind of relaxed and lying back. So she's kind of looking at her puppies like, oh, those are my puppies. I shouldn't, I shouldn't humanize their dogs. <laughs> I don't know if that's what you're saying, <laughs> but that's what we Good mama dog. Um, what do we think about these ears? They're both alert. The ears are upright and alert. They're listening to something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very alert. So yeah, they're definitely up and focused um, on something. I would say, um, and when we talk about the ears, I mean, again, it's hard to just talk about the ears, but you can also focus on some of this. You know, you can really see the tension between the ears. So that's like a highlight that the dog is definitely either focused or something or stressed about something. If he was nice and relaxed, there wouldn't be this tension behind the ears. That would be nice and soft here and it would be soft here. And I'm guessing the ears would probably be more relaxed, like not so focused forward, but slightly to the side. Um, sorry, I'm just getting private messages here. I'll just respond. Uh, okay. All right. Any questions about ears? No. Nope. Okay. And obviously, you know, I'm going to give you a lot of information today. Um, but, you know, I think the best thing really for me, one of my first dog trainers, he told me to just go to the dog park without your dog, which can be a bit of a weird old thing to do, but go to the dog park without your dog and just watch the dogs. If it's a busy dog park, you will see so much body language and the more you watch and the more you become attuned to the dogs, you'll see that they're communicating all the time. And they communicate both to other dogs and then they communicate to us as caregivers as well. Um, yeah, and it's, it's really, really interesting and um, just watching dogs play with each other, dogs interact with each other, watch dog videos on YouTube. There's horrible videos on there you know they're like mostly just funny videos but once you realize what you're watching you can start to get quite horrified <laughs> okay so the tail um so the tail is a good barometer for arousal um we talk about flagging versus wagging um the tail height and then the natural tail cap Okay, so let's just talk through these points. So again, at the start, I said it's important to understand what a dog looks like when they're relaxed. Some tails, um, some dogs will carry their tail, like, and it kind of sits quite flush with their body, you know, it kind of follows the groove of their back legs. Some dogs will carry their tail a little bit higher. There's some breeds who have like really curly tails and they actually curl up on their back. So it's really important to understand where the actual natural carriage of the tail is. Do you guys understand what I mean by that? Yes, uh, for instance, Hamish, who we have at the shelter right now, he has a tendency to just keep his tail low. Yeah. I don't know. If We've walked him, but he seems to like his tail is almost like scared tail. Yeah. But I don't think he is. No. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, exactly. So it's, yeah, it's good to know exactly where that natural position of the tail is. 
yeah, you're right. So, so once you understand where the natural tail carriage of your um, dog sits, or any dog, including shelter dogs, you can then start to understand what the tail is actually telling you. So for example, in this picture on the right, what do you think that tail, what is that tail, well, what position is that tail in? And what do you think it kind of means? Like, what do we, what do we see? Not natural position. It's yeah. not a natural somewhat scared. Yeah. Yeah. Fear. Yeah. So when a dog carries its tail kind of, you know, anywhere kind of fall, fall more forward than its back legs, I would say. This is yeah, definitely some kind of fear. The dog's feeling fearful or threatened. Um, I've seen, you know, dogs when their tails come so far under that they're actually touching, you know, their tummy. And it's definitely a sign of um, they're uncomfortable, they're fearful, you know, something's happening that they're not very comfortable about. What about the dog on the left? What do you think? Happy, alert. Totally yeah. aroused, ready, ready to go. Yeah, so where do you think that tail would normally be? Do you think that's his normal tail carriage? No. <laughs> yeah, so this tail is a little bit higher. Um, and that's one thing that we want to talk about is um, wagging versus flagging. So a wagging tail, the dog's tail is normally at its normal position and it's just doing a nice sweep back and forth, back and forth. Um, when we do dog meets, quite often people say, oh, it's okay, the dog is comfortable because his tail is wagging. His tail is probably up where the dachshund, is that a dachshund? No, that's a beagle. Beagle? beagle. A beagle. How did I even forget that? I've been fostering a beagle all week. <laughs> yeah. Um, that the foster that you hate. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yes, Ruby's gone in a sleepover, so I'm feeling a little bit better. It's a little strong. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I'm feeling less sleep deprived now that the beagle is not living in my house anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so this is, um, the tail is kind of quite high. And then if the tail was kind of flying back and forth very quickly, like almost like it's vibrating, that is a state of high arousal. Now it could be excitement as in, oh, I see another dog, I really want to play, but it can also be a sign of, oh, I see another dog, I'm not very comfortable. So it's really important that we kind of consider what the whole body is telling us in addition to that tail. But yeah, that very high, fast moving tail, that is not a tail wag, that is flagging. And it is a very good barometer for arousal. Um, the higher the tail, the faster, the more aroused it is. Um, and it's not always a good sign. And sometimes I've even seen tails are so high that they actually, the tip of the tail is touching the back. Any questions about this? Uh, given the, uh, well, here, here you go, Suzanne. Uh, uh, given the breed, this particular breed, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, they're hunting dogs. And so quite often they are trained to flag where they're going and how they're doing and what they're going after. Uh, so, uh, I mean, to me, this dog is looking at something that it needs to be looking at. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, that's it, it's like looking, he's got his eyes on something, he's definitely got his eyes on something, and whatever it is, has his interest, and that's brought his tail up, you know, and that could be through anything, you know, for us, like we use, like treats, for example, so sometimes like a dog will see the treats and they're like, whoa, and they're very focused on the treat, and you know, their tail come up a little bit, 
because they're exciting. So it's definitely, you know, a sign of um, ar arousal. So here, um, oh, <coughs> okay, so this is a video, actually, so this is a bark. I do volunteer at bark quite a bit. Um, and this is a video I shared. So tell me, is this tail flagging or is this tail wagging? Uh, he's uh, the white dog's flagging. Yeah. But he changed. He did, and I'm pressing all the buttons again. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So when we look at this tail, uh, like here, you can see it's pretty high. Mm -hmm. it's going, and then you see it slows down. It kind of slows down, but actually it slows down, but gets faster. It's a slower wag. And then here it starts to lower and then it goes back up again. And then here it goes low and goes back up again. I would say, it's a lower wide, but yeah, so you can definitely see the dog's changes and emotions by just looking at that tail. So once it kind of lowers and it gets a bit slower, that dog's a bit more relaxed, and then he gets a little bit more aroused um, and the tail goes up. Yeah. And the other part of it as well, if you think about it, if you think about, um, like why the tail does that. If you think about a dog's body, if the dog's body is starting to stiffen, then that automatically raises that tail up a bit. And then if the dog's body starts to relax, the tension in the body lessens and the tail kind of lowers down again. So it's kind of the whole body is connected. But yeah, that tail is definitely um, a sign of can be a very good um, indicator of what the dog feels. Okay, so. <laughs> I don't know why it calls you the one. Okay, so I want to watch this again. So the right wag, if a dog is weak, wagging its tail with more emphasis to the, oh, Jesus, let me stop this. Um, let's look at the right side again. Okay, so when the dog is, and you can look at the whole dog's body language. If they are wagging with more emphasis to the right side, it means they're more relaxed. If, um, if they become more stressed, you can actually see the transference of that tail wag to the left side. And I think you can see this in this video. It's, it's an interesting indicator of tail movement and tail wagging. Um, but I think you can see it if you look. So if you look, he looks quite soft, quite relaxed, and he's wagging to the right. Here, he's not wagging, okay, you know. And then- Well, it's closed. Yeah. You can see he just <laughs> is a little bit more tense and he's, um, he's wagging to the left. I am not very good at observing that, to be honest. And I would be like, is that the left side, the right side, or the left side? But anyway, <laughs> just <laughs> something to... Uh, has, has, has anybody ever done studies about dogs having, being right-handed or left-handed? That's a good question. I, I don't know. 
I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Interesting. I mean, I try every dog I've had. I, I always used to think that, well, this dog looks left-handed. This dog looks <laughs> right-handed. But, you know, I, you know, it's, it's, you know, it probably has to exist. Yeah, I guess more dominant, like a more dominant kind of side. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm going to try and speed up a little bit because I do, um, I do have a little bit more and we've only got 15 minutes. Okay. So head, let's look at the head on this dog. Um, what do we think? Kind of cowering down. Um, yeah, yeah. His head's down. He's lowered his head. Yeah, his head's down, and you can see as well. Like his whole face is. His eyes are kind of focused forward. Um, mouth is tensioned. Yeah, there's the mouth, um, the ears. You can yeah, the, the, you can just see. But yeah, the head is definitely. He's got his head lowered. He's feeling pretty stressed. Um, stressed about something. And he's got his paw lifted as well, which can be often a sign of uncertainty. Okay. Why am I not? Okay. What about this little white dog and his head? What's that saying? What do you think? What's the head doing? His head's very high and his ears are very alert. So is he being dominant? No, it looks to me like he understands the other dog's body language. And so he's not so sure to. He's a little unsure. Go, yeah. Go forward with playing. Yeah. So the, um, for me, when dogs kind of um, like, lift themselves up and bring that head up it's not a dominance thing um uh, and we don't really refer to dogs as like um as as dominant but it is a sign of um the dog is not comfortable so if a dog kind of lifts their head You'll sometimes see, I've got playgroup videos where um, like one dog will actually move over to the other dog and place his head over the back. And then we'll sometimes try and put the foot on the back. Um, and it's a sign of discomfort. It's a sign that this dog is not very comfortable in the situation. Um, and it could be because look at this little dog. I mean, that... <laughs> totally defensive. Yeah, we're seeing a, like, a lot of stress signs there. Like, that is not a particularly, hey, let's come and play face. That's like, you know, steady eyes, closed mouth, there's tense, there's like wrinkles up here, the ears are quite tense. So that's a tense face. So this dog is not comfortable with that. And you will see it, I see it. Um, you see it in different um, aspects. Like sometimes in playgroup, I see if you've got a really playful dog and it's running about, it's jumping everywhere, and it's kind of doing crazy things. And then the other dog is not too sure. And he just wants to like sniff the butt, for example, but he can't get near the butt because the other one's doing too many crazy things. They'll sometimes like put their head over and it's kind of like a, hey, stop doing that, like relax, like I'm uncomfortable with what you're doing, just calm down. Yeah. Any questions about that one? No, ma'am. No. And you can see he's got the little paw left again as well again, which is another size. Okay. Um, this is a really long video. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah. This is meant to um, highlight the dog's head, so the position of the dog's head. We'll maybe watch a little bit and how it changes. <laughs> so did you see the dog? <laughs> I know. So in this first one, do you see if you watch the dog and see the kind of 
transfer of weight and the movement of the head as the dog goes through these different, um, you know, oh, I see my, I see, oh, geez, trying to figure it out. Yeah, like I see them and then, so you can see the head and the body kind of stiffens, and then it wags and then the head goes down. He's like, oh, it's my friend. <laughs> so I think suppose <laughs> the other more interesting one is near the end. <laughs> now that one. So this one, I think he's here. <laughs> I, I, this is another good, Suzanne, I think this is a good example of the dog's tail. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so this one, again, it's like the dog hears somebody at the door. So you can see the body language of them hearing somebody at the door and how the head is quite upright and lifted and it's kind of very, you know, focused. And then when it realizes who it is, the head goes down and the whole body softens. And the tail, yeah, the tail's, the tail's flagging. Very very flagged and then it drops. And then it's like, oh, it's my, yeah. <laughs> it's my Christmas present <laughs> yes. that comes every day through the door. <laughs> yeah. Any questions or thoughts on the video? Well, the very first one that you showed, yeah, you could kind of see the dog reflecting off the human interaction as well, because she was kind of hunched over, sneaking up, and he was more tense until realized who it was. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the <coughs> okay. This one. Um... Can you guys see my screen or is it still there? Oh. No, we can see it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so looking at this, <laughs> I would guess that this um, dog is also making noise. Um, I mean, I don't know why anybody would do that and the dog does this and they continue to do it, to be honest. I mean, again, this is one of these ones when people do crazy things and they get bitten. So if a dog <laughs> does this, I would not suggest you do what this person is doing. <laughs> What do you think? What do you think that dog's saying? Or what's the body language communicating? He's annoyed. He's doesn't want to be touched on his paws, obviously. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm wondering if maybe we oh. the dog ought to do that. So oh so <laughs> oh geez. Sorry, it went straight into the next video. Yeah, sorry, what were you saying? I, I just wonder if the, that dog was taught to do that. Mm. Pull, your, pull, your, yeah. pull your teeth back, if, pull your lips back if you get touched on the paws. It, it, it's, and 
I don't like that video. No, I don't like that video at all. I mean, it's really not, yeah. not a good video. All right. We've only got a few more slides, so I'll try and knock it out before, before 2 p.m. Okay, so displacement and calming signals. Um, the book that we recommend, um, oh, calming signal, I guess, is um, talks a lot about calming signals, but displacement and calming signals are essentially signals that dogs give to other dogs to just, um, you know, highlight that, hey, I'm not a threat, you know, there's no need to be, um, you know, you don't need to be defensive about anything, I'm not a threat, I'm not being offensive. Um, and these are signals that actually we can use with dogs as well. So um, we talk a lot, and I'm sure you guys um, will learn this at the shelter, that if you approach a kennel, you never want to just walk up face first, like with your body directly in front of the kennel, lean over the kennel, peer in the kennel, see what the dog's doing. You always wanna kind of come up to the kennel side on. It's a lot less threatening to dogs and it's actually quite incredible. I have worked at other shelters and if somebody walks up face front and full front and like um, leans over the kennel, the dog will react. If that person then just turns side on and averts their gaze, doesn't give a real direct stare, the dog will actually calm down. So it's just a very different um, way of approaching. So, okay, so these are some calming signals. So the first one is look away. You'll quite often, if you look at a dog, you'll see the dog look away. Or, um, you know, if two dogs kind of come up and sniff at each other, one of the dogs might look away. That's just a signal. It's like, you know, I'm not giving you a hard stare. I'm not giving you crazy eye contact. I'm all good. You know, there's no threat here. Um, and, you know, it can also be a little bit, I'm a little bit unsure of this. So just look away. And I quite often use this as well. Like if a dog looks at me and they look a little bit unsure, I'll look away and then I'll re-engage and then I'll look away again. It's just a less threatening kind of um, way of interacting with the dog. The lip lick you can see in the middle, you'll see the tongue will actually come out and the dog will do uh, just lick its lips. Um, now some people will be like, well, maybe he's just hungry. If the dog licks his lips after he's eating a big bowl of food, that probably indicates he's just licking his lips. He's eating a big, um, a big bowl of food. If he's licking his lips and there's no food around, then that is a sign that that dog is uncomfortable with the situation. Um, other things, like yawning. When the dog is obviously not tired, you know, they're just like doing yawns. You'll see this sometimes if you take like a dog out into the yard and the dog's not too sure of the circumstances, you might see them look away, you might see them lick their lips, you might see them do big yawns. It's kind of behaviors that are not um, relevant to the situation, if you guys understand what I mean. You know, they're, they're yawning, but they're not tired. They're just, you know, it's a sign that they're uncomfortable and it's also a calming signal to us and to other dogs. I talked about the paw lift as well. Like if a dog is standing and it lifts one of its front paws or it's sitting and it lifts one of its front paws, that can also be a sign that the dog's a little bit uncomfortable. And again, we call them displacement signals because there's, there's signals that are, are not really relevant to the situation. And again, the other two is like out of context sniffing and out of context grooming. So for example, if you brought two dogs out to do a meet and like one of the dogs is not looking at the dog and it's like off sniffing the ground like really intently next to it, that's kind of out of context sniffing. You know, you've brought a dog out, you would expect the dogs to be interested in each other, but one dog's like off sniff, 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 sniffing intensely. Um, that's an indication that that dog is not comfortable with the other dog. Any questions about these? Yeah. Okay. OK, 
Okay, so we talk about as well, common, we've got distance increasing signals and then distance decreasing signals. Um, distance is increasing signals. We hear this a lot, like people will say, oh, my dog jumps up when um, I come home, or not when I come home, but my, my dog jumps on me all the time uh, and it's because they're happy to be around me. Sometimes they're jumping up and it's because they're uncomfortable, like they meet a new person and they jump on the person. The way we tend to tell if it's an oppositional jumping up is they actually jump up and then they push off. You'll see some dogs will jump up and they'll kind of like snuggle into the person. That's more like a, oh, I like you kind of jumping up. If the dog is actually jumping up and then pushing off the person with both paws, that's an oppositional jumping up. That's like a distance increasing signal. It's trying to, the dog is trying to create distance between itself and the person. Um, closed uh, shoulder rub. Yeah, some of these are things that you'll just see more often, um, again, when you're observing dogs. Like you'll start to see these things, like you'll start to work with the behavior chain and they'll say, oh, that was a shoulder rub or that's oppositional jumping or oppositional mouthing. Once you start seeing it, you'll be able to see exactly what it looks like. You can also Google it, have a look and see if you can see some videos of these things on the internet. Um, closed mouth head turn. So we talked about when a dog closes its mouth. We also talked about when a dog looks away. Quite often a closed mouth head turn is really, you know, again, a um, signal that this dog is not comfortable with whatever is going on. So it could be it's not comfortable with the other dog or it's not comfortable about with us. And quite often you might see closed mouth, head turn, and then quick tongue licks. Um, yeah, freeze. Freezing for me is probably one of the worst things that a dog can do because when they freeze, you're not really quite sure what they're going to do. Um, but yeah, like a freeze is really, you know, they're, they're really saying, I am not comfortable in this situation. Please move away. A snark. Snark is like, I don't know if you've seen your dog do it, but like if something's irritating and then they just kind of, it's not like a real, it's not like an ear snap. It's not like a bark. It's just like a, get away from me. I had enough. My old girl does it to puppies. Like she's just like, oh, I'm so mad with you. And she'll just snark at them. Um, and then a growl, obviously the growl is the little, and then the snarl is, I think people realize that those last two are distance increasing signals. <laughs> so, uh, so for instance, Hamish, yeah. when I was sitting on the couch with him, he really wanted to crawl into my lap. Uh, but I kind of resisted that. And then what ended up happening is he started to hump me. Yeah, yeah. Lipstick stick, stick out, and I realized he was reaching a, a you know a, a point of arousal that I had to change the dynamic. Um, so, yeah, what do you, what do you, what are your comments about that, Suzanne? Yeah, so he's been doing that a little bit, um, and I think what that is, it's not a distance increasing signal, but what it is is, um, for example. He jumps in you because he wants attention. So he's not, right. so when he jumps in you, it's like he jumps on you and he wants to like sit on top of you. It's not he jumps on you and he pushes off you with both paws. Um, so when he does that, what's happening is he's being rude. He's looking for attention. We're not giving him the attention he wants because we're like, no, that's rude. That's not the way you ask for attention. So then he starts to get frustrated. And as he gets frustrated, that's where, you know, the arousal comes in. And then he starts to like, and, you know, um, humping can be a sign of frustration. You know, humping can be different things. Okay. 
you know, lots of people think it's a sexual thing. It can be really, um, like Julio, for example, will hump other dogs when he's not comfortable with them. Um, you know, when he starts humping, it's like, okay, he's not uncomfortable, let's separate them and let them back. For, for um, him, yeah. he starts humping when he's getting frustrated. He wants something, he's not getting it, and so he's going to start humping. Um, he humped PC yesterday, just FYI. <laughs> Oh, did he? Yeah. So it's a male thing, maybe? <laughs> <Yes>. Wow. <laughs> or maybe you guys just don't give him what he wants. <laughs> nah. I, well. Yeah, we're trying to teach him to ask nicely for stuff. Okay. Yeah. Common distance decreasing signals. So we talked about what increasing signals are. Um, play by... These two dogs are doing a perfect example of play by. This is them inviting each other to come and play. So that's like a, that's a distance decreasing signal. It's saying, hey, I'm comfortable with you. I want to play with you. Let's go. Um, the hip bump, that again is, um, you watch dogs sometimes and you'll just see the back end, their hip, they'll bump it against the other, where it's like right the shoulder, at the back, but they'll just slightly bump that hip off the dog. And that again is kind of like a, hey, Come play, or you know, hey, I like you. Let, let's go do something. <laughs> um, active appeasement again. Quite often, when you see dogs playing, they might. Um, so there's two different kind of. Um, yes, did we talk about it? No, I think it is. It's deference. So when a dog kind of rolls on its back and starts like urinating and stuff. That is called deference. That is like that dog is really um, not comfortable. It's scared. When they roll on their back and they're all soft and wiggly and they're kind of like, you know, next to another dog, that's active appeasement. They're kind of like, hey, you know, let's be friends. Like, I want you to come closer and I want to play with you. Um, relaxed secular tail wagging. So again, you know, this tail's kind of the neutral. If he starts getting the big happy helicopter tail, that's a, you know, distance decreasing signal. That's how dogs communicate to each other that they're comfortable with the other one and they want to engage. And then high pitch vocalizations. That's a common one. Um, many people get quite scared when dogs vocalize. A lot of dogs, it's quite common for them to vocalize when they're in play. Any questions about that? I have a question uh, back about the uh, common um, distance increasing signals. So yeah. when, we're with, we're, when we're with a dog and it shows any of those signals, are, should we just b back up, you know, These physically? Ones? Yeah, I would. Like if a dog, if I go into a kennel and the dog kind of does a close mouth head turn, I'm like, okay, I'm not going to come in any, any further. I'll probably move away a little bit and I'll just sit and hide and see if the dog wants to come to me. It's just like a sign, especially in the chicken shelter environment, that they're not that comfortable. Our dogs do it too. You know, you'll see now that you start to understand and you hear these things and, you know, you're going to read the Canon Signals book, you'll start to see more of these things. And it, like, it doesn't mean that dog hates you. It just means... That dog right now doesn't want you to come close. Just, you know, keep your distance and then let the dog come to you. And that's generally my approach with all our dogs. Like, I will let the dog come to me because then it's their choice. I'm not, you know, decreasing the distance. They choose to decrease the distance. Um, some of the really scared dogs, you'll see them. They'll have, um, like, the whale eye. They'll have the real closed mouth. They'll turn their head away. They'll be lip lipping. Um, yeah, it's okay. So, like, do a bur dogs like Bruno? What's that? Uh, dogs like Bruno? Uh -huh. T Rex, I guess it is now. Uh, you know, he he would solicit affection from me, but you know, leashing him up was always still a iffy proposition. Yeah, so again, he's just... You no, know, he was really happy to get leashed up. Yeah. He, once he was. 
He's another um, kind of special case, and we're still kind of trying to look into him, really establish what's happening there. Um, you know, I don't know. I We kind of think there might be something more there. But yeah, he's like a dog who really doesn't like to be touched. So again, we have to do it on his, his kind of... Uh, oh, terms. Yeah, his terms. Because like, you know, he has, yeah, he's a little rat bag. Like he has solicited affection from me and been getting really into it and run himself all over me. And then suddenly he just bites me. Turn around, turn around, snap at you. Yeah, and then goes straight back and asks for more pets. I'm like, well, no, because you just bit me, you rat bag. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any other questions about the distance increasing, distance decreasing? Oh, okay. So I guess just some final notes um, on this. Like a picture is just very much a picture. It's hard for us to look at these pictures and really um, see what is actually happening. I think you guys did a great job. You know, you're seeing, you're recognizing the things that we're looking for. But a picture isn't just a picture. Um, like we are moving much more towards video now because video gives you a little bit more context. You can see a bit more of actually what's happening, what else is in this um, environment, you know, that's, that's impacting that. Um, really practice describing the behavior um, using what you're observing. Like what is the body language saying? Not what you are interpreting. So we can say, that's a happy dog. But again, as I explained, like a happy dog to you and a happy dog to me might not mean the same thing. But if we're very um, just, what's the word? You know, we focus on what we can see. What is the dog in front of us telling us? Like, what is their body language doing? Then we can communicate with each other a lot more clearly. Um, when in doubt, listen to your instincts. Like, honestly, you know, sometimes I'll be like, yeah, I'm just going to back up. And somebody's like, what happened? Did he growl? Did he snarl? Did he, you know, was he tense? And it's like, you know what? I just didn't feel comfortable. So trust your instincts. <laughs> if you don't feel comfortable, if somebody says to you, can you go into that kennel? You walk up to the kennel, you look in at the dog and you say, like, I am not comfortable. Listen to your instincts because they're probably right. Okay. Um, and then the last thing, if you see something interesting, Melissa wrote, take a picture. I'll tell you now, don't take a picture, take a video, because she's always going to ask you if you have a video. So yeah, that is really the presentation for today. Has anybody got any questions, queries, comments, thoughts, feedback? So we, so we now log these hours on the portal, right? Is that right? And uh, this is class. I think you can. I think you can record this as BB two training. Um, okay. Yeah, I think you can. I guess the next part as well is we need to agree on a time when we're going to meet to do to do the second Zoom call, which really should just be an hour. Um, we can do it next Saturday if that works for people or. What do people think? So the next Zoom class is going to be an addition to this BV2, correct? Yes. Yeah, so this is BV, BV2 part one. OK. The BV2 part two, where we talk about managing reactive dogs. Um, so we talk about that. And then there's a BV2 part three, which is actually in the shelter. Um, where you guys come in and we'll do a dog to dog and we'll actually walk a reactive dog and we'll demonstrate how to do that safely. Okay. So how do we log these hours? So you should be able to... On French from on the portal, right? Yeah. You should be able to go to the portal. Let's see if I can do this. At least for me, my only option is BV1 training. I don't see a BV2 training. Okay, so it might 
be Savannah's issue. Yeah, so I think what it is, is um, you probably can't log it until you've done the training. So okay, maybe write down on a piece of paper that you've done the training. And then um, once you've completed all three sessions, um, then I'm sure Savannah will open it up and then you can log it. Great, thank you. You said you were recording this so we can watch it again. How, will that just be on the portal or how do we find it? Um, I, I hate the fact we record this, but <laughs> and now Melissa can watch it and see what I was saying, whether I was right. But um, yeah, I think what we'll do is we'll record it and then um, let me talk to Savannah. Maybe we'll just send it out to all the MBTs, um, and then you guys can review it. It might be that we upload it to YouTube because it's two hours long. In fact, it's two hours and 15, and I've really gone over. But um, it's quite long, so it'll be quite a big file. So I'll ask Savannah, maybe we'll log it onto, uh, put it onto YouTube and then share it. Okay. And then you, you said you send out a, a, an email saying it's on YouTube or something. So, yeah, I'll, work, I'll get with Savannah. I'll, I'll work out what we want to do with that. Okay, thank you. And, and then maybe what we'll do is I'll just get Savannah to copy me on that email. So, we'll send it to all you guys. And then we'll try and coordinate a time where we can actually do the managing a reactive walk. If this time works, we can do it. Um, like 12 o'clock or one o'clock next Saturday, um, we can do that. Yeah. What time did you guys actually begin today? Did 12. You 12 mm -hmm. o'clock. <laughs> About quarter two? 12 o'clock. 12, oh, you, yeah. you began at 12. Mm -hmm. eh, Savannah told me one. <laughs> That's all right. So for all of you guys who don't know or recognize that like David's been a long-term volunteer at the shelter. So a lot of what we talked about in the first hour of David was more about the Facebook page, um, how to log your hours, what the BB program looks like. But again, I'll share the video with you and you can watch the whole thing if you really want to watch me talk. Thank you, Thank you for allowing me to participate. <laughs> Always a pleasure. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you. And if you guys have any feedback as well for me, I love to get feedback, especially constructive feedback about how I can do um, things better. Um, yeah, so please feel free to share that to me. All right. Well, thank and, you, and Suzanne. What about, thank what you, what Suzanne. About, what about the slide? What was that, David? The slideshow, the actual. Probably share that as well. I guess we can. I mean, it's in the video, but yeah. I mean, the, the slideshow itself is just pictures. Um, I know. But... I'm sure we can share it. Yeah. All right. Well, I better go because I've been slacking off now for two hours and not walking dogs. So. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate right. it. It's fun. Thank you. Hey. Thank you. How did, how did it work out with the doc? Yes, uh, on Thursday. Uh, oh, the doctor? Yeah. Um, yeah, good. Um, uh, yeah, she's okay. She's okay? 